Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. And we can't say enough how grateful we are that today you're with us. And God, I know this. There's people that have come here today with all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of situations. Um, <laughs> but today we know this. You're crazy about each and every one of us. And this is what we know today, that as we open up your word, that you have a message for every one of us, that you want to speak to us. That's crazy to us. With all the things going on in the world today, you want to speak to us today. And so here we are, again, from all backgrounds. We would love to hear from you today. So speak to us, challenge us, convict us. Make us more like Jesus. And for that, we'll give you praise. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Maybe may be seated. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Hey, listen, are you more comfortable today? You got a little bit? We, uh, we, uh, we had a dilemma these last few weeks. Uh, I told you we purchased a certain amount of chairs. Well, we had to bring in a little over 100 plus chairs just so we weren't so squashed in this place. And uh, we nearly filled this up. And so uh, you all keep bringing people with you, all right? We'll keep adding chairs. We don't know where we'll find them, but we will find them. Get this. Uh, how many here last week, the baptism service? Uh, we could probably say phenomenal, right? Yeah. Pretty amazing service. Um, I've already had calls this week about people who have made decisions to follow Jesus that want to be baptized next time we have baptisms which is awesome. It's awesome. And so uh, the first Sunday in January, we're going to do it again. We're going to do this as much as we can uh, just because, listen, if, if people are receiving Jesus and they're going to begin following Jesus, uh, we want to celebrate it in front of everybody. And so if you're here this week and you made a decision last week, which, listen, a lot of you did, get a hold of us. And if you've never been baptized, um, we will get the horse trough up here. It said for livestock only on it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to write the company and say you've got to change it. For livestock and baptisms only, um, we will uh, baptize you in front of this group. And again, God's just doing some neat things. Uh, this last Sunday, we, we had 564 people that came and worshipped. And we have two services here. If you're new with us, we have a, a service at 9 o'clock that meets over in the sanctuary. And I'm telling you, God is doing some great things in that service. Uh, it just keeps growing. And, um, and then, of course, here we just have to keep adding more chairs. Isn't it fun to be part of an exciting church? I think so, right? I think so. We're uh, on a series um, about the life of David. It's been a fun series. We've been diving into First and Second Samuel, uh, just getting some glimpses of David's life. Today, in 2 Samuel 9, if you have your scriptures with you, if not, we'll put it up on the screen. Um, this, to me, is probably, although it's one of the, it's a very unfamiliar story to people when it comes to David. It's not on the David top five list, but the story we're going to talk about today is my absolute favorite David story, because it gives us a glimpse of the character and heart of David again. You see, I'm convinced of this, you guys, that our actions will reveal who or what we serve. Our actions, the things that we do, are going to eventually reveal who or what we serve. And I'm not talking about a Sunday morning. Now, on Sunday morning, it's, it's easy to have actions that reveal who we serve, right? I mean, when the band's playing and they're uh, just rocking out the house to... To God, and you know that when, when they play their instruments and they sing, we're not singing to each other, right? We're singing to the good man upstairs. And when we're singing, man, have you ever been so moved that you just want to raise your hand? I know some of you have. And some of you come from more Pentecostal backgrounds. You might get so excited, you might even raise <laughs> your other hand, you know? <laughs> but we don't go much further than that, do we? I'm just kidding. 
But it's easy. Our actions show that, man, we love serving God, don't we? We get excited about serving God. And, and in a service like this, I've seen it where people get so moved, they just stand up and say, I want to tell the whole world that I serve God. I mean, it's fun to be a part of a service like that, isn't it? There's churches all across America that would love to see what's going on here. But I'm not talking about our actions here at church on Sunday. Because again, it's, I think it's easy for us to have actions that show who we serve. But what about Monday through Saturday? I mean, what are your actions? What are the conversations that you have? What are the things that you do? What are the things that you watch? I mean, would your actions, if, if you knew that Jesus was able to follow you around all week, which according to Scripture, he does, I mean, if you knew that he was with you all week, would your actions say, listen, Jesus, I serve you? We're going to dive into the story. Again, it's a, it's a neat story, but before we do, I just want to go off on a little rabbit trail here real quick, briefly. Speaking of actions, um, what is it with all of you and your tea peeing? I don't understand it. We were having a great family night the other night, and we were sitting, my dog started barking again, which is usually a sign like, oh boy, these wild southern Illinois people are at it again. And I was looking for toilets, and I didn't find any toilets, but my yard was covered in toilet paper. Well, I decided to chase them down this time. I hopped in my truck, and I was chasing somebody down, and, and I found out who it was, but there's a whole group of people. And so I've just decided, once I can afford toilet paper... Some of you are in trouble. (laughs) Strange practical jokes here. (laughs) That's just my rabbit trail. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Keep in mind, at this point, David had been uh, put in the place of the king. Uh, Saul is now dead and gone. We've been talking about this the last few weeks just to try to catch some of you up. Uh, David, who had been running for his life at times, who had these highs, these lows, um, who had all sorts of crazy things, now was was seated on the throne. He had uh, all the power in the world. He had all the money in the world. Um, He was just, a, uh, as you can imagine, a very, very busy man, and his life had radically changed. I mean, you remember the first uh, part of the series that we had was David was just a shepherd boy. I mean, just an ordinary snot-nosed kid tending sheep. And uh, now we've gone on this journey where he is now the king um, on top of the world. And it would have been easy for him just to be consumed with self and what's going on in his life. But listen to what we find out. Again, this is one of my absolute favorite stories in Scripture when it comes to David. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 says this. David asked, again, after he's been king, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul. And stop there for a few seconds. You know, if it was us writing this, or if there's us uh, being put in David's shoes, many of us would say, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul? Because if there is, I'm going to make their life miserable. Because again, we've, we've talked about this. Saul's last remainder of his life, and Saul didn't finish well. Uh, Saul's a really tragic story. Saul did not finish well at all. The remainder of Saul's life was spent trying to kill David and cause harm to him because he knew that God's hand was on him. And so here's David. He's saying, hey, listen, is there anybody left in the house of Saul? And if it was you and I, we would say, because if there is, we want to make this guy's life absolutely miserable because he deserves it. But we find out by David's actions, we know who David served. Listen to how it goes on. Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show, say it with me, kindness Kindness for Jonathan's sake? It's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, here was David who probably had a lot of things going on in his life and and who probably had a crazy busy schedule and had so many things that he had to take care of and, and he was on top of the world and his mind goes back to, is there anybody left in Saul's house that I can show kindness to? Well, he brings in one of his servants, and he asks him that question. He says, hey, listen, is there anybody in, in Saul's house that, that I can show this random act of kindness to? And, and the servant said, well, yes, there's a, a boy. Now, listen, I've been working on this name all week. 
Uh, I asked Pastor Mark it, and Mark's going to be watching this message here in a little bit. Mark can just say this name like it's nothing. I think it's because he wanted to, if he ever had a boy, he's going to name his boy this. But the boy's name was Mephoboseth. Anybody here ever name their child that? I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> Mephoboseth was the child's name. And Scripture tells us when they said his name, they followed it up with this. Mephiboseth, who had two lame feet. It's very significant. The author of this wanted to make it clear that this boy was crippled. And the reason why he needed to, to all of us to know this was because in that time, especially in a royal family, a boy who was crippled was going to be kind of pushed aside. A boy who was crippled was, was, was not a sign of royalty. In fact, many of them thought it was a sign of weakness in that day. And especially in a king's home, they didn't want, want somebody who, who had these ailments out in front. And so probably this boy sat in his room a lot. He didn't play with all the other kids. He didn't come out in public a lot. He was probably just pushed aside. And I'm guessing we can think he was probably pretty lonely. And David said, well, I want to talk to this boy. I want you to bring him in because I want to show him kindness. And could you imagine what was going on in this boy's mind? Again, probably his whole life he was just pushed aside probably a nobody, probably very lonely, probably even felt like he was an embarrassment to the family. And the king, David, who his grandfather had been trying to kill, wants him to come into his presence. And so scripture says that Mephiboseth comes in to the king's presence, and it reminds us, it says that he was the son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, which again reminds us that if there's any guy who deserved to be punished, many of us would say it would be him because of the family that he came from. And Scripture says that he comes and he bows low before the king, probably wondering what in the world is going to happen to me, probably thinking that this is the end for me because of my grandfather Saul. But listen to what David says in 2 Samuel 9, 7, and 8. He says, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will say it with me, always eat at my table. He didn't say you will sometimes eat at my table. He didn't say, hey, listen, let me try to get things cleaned up, and we'll try to get everything in order, and, and maybe this next week, if we have time, we'll invite you over. He didn't say, hey, once a month, you know, if it works for us, we'll have you over. He said, you will always, breakfast, lunch, and supper, you will always sit at the king's table. Could you imagine what was going through that boy's mind at that moment? Mesobosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, here's this young boy saying, what in the world is going on that you should notice? I mean, somebody like me, my whole life I haven't been noticed. I mean, my whole life I've been pushed aside and, and I probably deserve punishment. I probably deserve to be treated like a dead dog. But for some reason, you have noticed me. You know what's something? That's what people want today, isn't it? I mean, we just want to be noticed, don't we? We just want somebody to look at us and pay attention. Uh, we got a new thing going on in my home. Uh, when my kids were born, I always dreamed that they would be, you know, these professional basketball players, including my daughter. I thought she'd be the first to go to the NBA. You know what my daughter's into right now? Cheerleading. I mean, most of my upbringing, it was all boys in my family. And so this cheerleading is new to me. And my daughter, from the time she's a little girl, she's enjoyed tumbling and doing the splits and doing all this stuff. And, and now it just seems to be working really well for her cheerleading. And, and so she's out there now. We had our first basketball tournament my son was playing in. But we ended up watching my daughter more than my son because she's out there more than my son. <laughs> I know, I know. So my daughter's out there cheering, you know, and doing her thing, whatever they do and, you know. And we're watching there, and I, I catch myself getting really excited about it, you know, like, oh, great move, Gabrielle, you know, <laughs> you know. I'm cheering like crazy. And you know what I notice about her? 
when she walks out to the center court and does her cheers, every once in a while, you know what she does? She looks up at mom and dad just to see if we're noticing her. And when she's done, she walks back and she keeps glancing up at us. And she has that kind of excited little smile, but she doesn't want to show that she's super excited. But, but inside she's saying, they noticed me. You know, they saw me. And of course, we're going berserk. Look like crazy people in the crowd. And then my son playing basketball. My, my son gets in about 37 seconds in the game. And man, it's the best 37 seconds of the game, I'm telling you. <laughs> Unbelievable. And we're watching him, and he's out there playing, and he's, he's running all over the place. And, and my wife's helping me, saying, I told you, you got to teach him some stuff. You know, I'm like, well, I don't know anything about this stuff. And, and he's out there running around, throwing his arms around. And, and then finally the coach says, we got to get this kid out of here. You know, he's, he's dominating out there, so we got to pull him out of there, you know. And so my son goes running off the court, and he sits down. You know what he does? He sits down, and the first thing he does is he looks up at mom and dad. Because he wants us to notice him. And my kids, I mean, that's all we hear at home. They're at that age where, Dad, look at me. Dad, look at me. Dad, look at me. And I just think, if you guys would all just come together really close, I can look at you all, you know? <laughs> they want us to notice them. It's a big deal to us, isn't it? And you think you lose that, but you don't. As you get older, I, I can remember as a youth pastor, one of the neat things about the, the church I was a part of when I was a youth pastor is we got all sorts of of kids in our youth group. In fact, we'd go out to these big church events and, and all the other churches would say, oh yeah, Kramer, he's got the dysfunctional group. And I'd be like, yes, I do, you know, because they were wild. And I'd have kids come in and they would they'd have piercings and, and uh, you know, I had some that would paint their fingernails black. And even some guys, this was weird to me, they'd like put like some eye makeup on their eyes. And it was always strange to me, but I had good enough relationships, too, where I could go kind of make fun of them, you know? And they'd be like, well, dude, I just do this so no one would notice me. And I'm just trying to be myself. And I'd be like, that's not true, you know? While you're putting your eye makeup on, you're thinking, I want people to notice me. And it's not just that kind of thing. It's all of us. I mean, think about getting ready for church and, and all the things that we do. We wouldn't do all this if we just didn't want people to notice us. And I'm telling you, we've got people all around us that just are looking for somebody to notice them. But here's what's neat about all of this. In the story that we just began to read about, David was looking for a person in need. And so here was somebody that was just hoping somebody would notice him. And David was out looking for somebody in need. I wonder sometimes, do we look for people who are in need? I mean, we want people to notice us. But do we ever say, you know what, I'm going to on purpose go out and I'm going to look for somebody in need. I found the stat on the internet, and of course what we find on the internet is always true. Four out of ten people, get this, you guys, four out of ten people experience extreme loneliness. Isn't that something? With all the things going on in the world today and how we can keep ourselves so busy. In fact, if we just took this crowd today, I mean, if this stat is correct, four out of ten of us will experience extreme loneliness. And teenagers, I'm going to pick on you here. They tell us that stat is even greater for teenagers. I mean, you think about all the activities you have going on in your life, that even more than four out of ten of you at some point in your life will experience extreme loneliness. I want to be the kind of follower of Jesus Christ that looks for those kind of people. I told you when I moved here a few months ago, um, something radically changed my life. I joined Facebook. <laughs> You know what's funny about Facebook? It's some of you put way too much information on Facebook. <laughs> but what's funny about, not funny about Facebook, and listen, when I talk about these things, I'm not belittling anybody's circumstance, okay? I know there's people in here that are going through some very difficult circumstances. But many times when I'm reading through Facebook, I, 
I see people just put things like, I'm feeling very sad today. I always have several thoughts go through my mind, and one of them is, why are you telling the whole world that? Or, I'm having a really bad day today. I often wonder, why are we just throwing out that for for everybody to hear? Maybe it's because we're feeling lonely. Maybe it's because we want somebody to notice us. And I think many times when we have things go on in our life, we can get so consumed with what's going on in our life and ourselves that, man, these, these very difficult circumstances just continue to build and build and get bigger and bigger. You know what I think? I think we need to learn to turn our focus from self to others. I mean, could you imagine? Again, I don't want to belittle anybody's difficult circumstance today. But maybe instead of just saying, hey, to the whole world, I'm having a very bad day or I feel sad today, what if we, we took that focus from self and said, you know what, I'm going to go look for somebody today that is feeling sad. And I'm going to make their day better. Or what if we know somebody that... that we might know in the community that you know are just going through a difficult circumstance. And and instead of just focusing on our issues, what he said, I'm going to focus on their issue. You know, I've discovered in my own life, when I'm active in ministry and helping people out, my problems don't seem as big anymore. My issues don't seem as big anymore. And here was David, who had all sorts of things on his plate, all sorts of things that he was trying to keep up with. He began to look not at self, but look for a person in need. Well, not only did he look for a person in need, David sacrificed to meet that need. You see, this young man, who again was pushed aside for most of his life, David said, listen, from this point forward, every time we serve food at the king's table, I'm going to sacrifice to make sure that you're there. Breakfast, lunch, and supper, I'm going to make sure that you're sitting at the king's table. Now listen, we read that story and think, isn't that nice? But let's take it into our world. I mean, ladies, listen. What if your husband came home one day and said, oh, hey, honey, it was a great day at work. Oh, by the way, I invited so-and-so over to our house. And she'd say, oh, when, next week? No, actually, every meal... For the rest of his life. <laughs> I can tell you, my wife would be like, what? <laughs> you know? We would be in a panic at our house. But that's what David did. He sacrificed for this. A few years back, when I was young and foolish, last year, <laughs> we had a gentleman in my community, as best as I can describe him, is he was a grumpy old man. I mean, he was just one of those grumpy old men, and, and this is why I can say this with confidence, he's a grumpy old man. The first time I invited him out to eat, I said, I said hey, so-and-so, let's go out to the cafe, and I told him a specific cafe, and he said, oh, I can't go there. I got in an argument with so-and-so at the table, and then it broke out into another argument over here, and, and eventually I started arguing with the owner of the restaurant, and, and I'm no longer allowed at that cafe. I said, okay, let's go to the one across the street. He said, well, funny thing is got in an argument with so-and-so there, and I swung at this guy here, and the owner said, I can no longer come to this cafe. Now, where I came from, there's like only three places to eat, okay? And so I said, well, where can we go? And, and there's a gas station in town where you can order pizza. And he said, I'm still allowed to go there. So I went out, and, and as I began to talk to this guy, I discovered this guy was just lonely. I mean, he had no family, and and he just had a lot of anger built up inside of him, and nobody wanted to be around him, and it was very understandable why. I mean, he's just a grumpy old man. And, and so I went out to eat this guy, and I said, hey, listen, this Sunday, come to church, and, and after church, we'll, we'll grill some steaks, and you can come on over to my house. Well, he was excited to do that. I mean, he's telling everybody around town that he was going to Mike Kramer's house, you know, and it was, it was a big deal, and I felt good about that, but, but then something just blindsided me. You know what that Sunday was? I didn't see it coming. It was Mother's Day. Yeah, I know. My wife never warned me about it. <laughs> I mean, who am I? I mean, it was Mother's Day. 
And so I can remember, you know, I come to church and it's Mother's Day and, you know, I'm in my office, you know, working on a card, you know, and, and this guy comes in, he's like, oh, I'm excited to come to your house today. I'm like, oh no, you know. And I'll never forget that Mother's Day. Me and this grumpy old man sat around a table with my kids, <laughs> my beautiful wife. We celebrated Mother's Day together, you know. But this is what's crazy about my wife. She gives me a hard time for it still today. My wife's willing to sacrifice for people. She knew that this guy was lonely and that this guy didn't have family. And, and so she was willing to sacrifice her Mother's Day. What might we sacrifice for one in need? For some of us, it might be money. Where God has blessed you with extra resources and and this is something when you look around is how many needy people there are. Not bad people, but people who are just going through a very difficult time. I believe today there's so many great things that we can give our financial resources to. And for some of us, I think we could sacrifice. I mean, we spend a lot on all sorts of things. I think some of us could sacrifice some of our finances. But it's not just money. For some of you, money is an easy one. You've just been blessed with a lot of it. For some of you, it might be time. What's interesting, when I go around and talk to people and we ask how you're doing, you know what the answer is? We give a lot and I do the same thing. Oh, busy, busy. Busy, busy, busy. As if we're the only ones in the world busy, right? And it just, for whatever reason, makes us feel better about saying we're busy. I'm, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm crazy busy all until about deer season. I just sing, slow down for me. No. But you know, for some of you, you know what's difficult? To sacrifice time. I mean, you got a lot of things going on in your life, and you got, you got schedules to keep up, and you got family, and you're running to ball games, and you're running to kids' activities, and, and you got school stuff, and you got job stuff, and then the church, we keep you guys so busy. We got so many things. Maybe we ought to block some of that time off for people who are in need and sacrifice some of our time. For some of us, it's energy. It's amazing with our schedules that we have today how worn out we get. I'm new to this basketball thing, sports thing, brand new to it. I used to make fun of you parents who run all over the country sporting events, and now I'm one of you. But you know what? It wears you out. You're running all over the place and trying to keep up with all sorts of things, and we just come to the end of the day and say, I just got no more energy. I think for some of us, it's a sacrifice to give up that kind of energy. Someone once who worked closely with Mother Teresa wrote this. People often ask me what Mother Teresa was like. She was short, wrinkled, and precious. Maybe even a little ornery. Like a beautiful, wise old granny. But there's one thing I'll never forget. Her feet. Her feet were deformed. Each morning in Mass, I would stare at them. I wondered if she'd contracted leprosy. But I wasn't going to ask, of course, hey, Mother, what's wrong with your feet? One day, a sister said to us, have you noticed her feet? We nodded, curious. She said her feet are deformed because we get just enough donated shoes for everyone. And Mother does. She does not want anyone to get stuck with the worst pair. So she digs through and finds them. And years of doing that have deformed her feet. Years of loving her neighbor as herself deformed her feet. She made a lot of sacrifices for other people. A question I just want to throw out to all of us. What sacrifices are we willing to make for those in need around us? I want to challenge us. I want this to be one of the marks of our church That's a group of men and women that by their actions, they show who they serve. And they are willing to sacrifice so much for so many of those around us who are in need. Scripture says in 1 Peter 3, Who will hurt you if you do what is right? But even if you should suffer for what is good, for what is right, you will be happy. Do not be afraid or troubled by what they may do to make it hard for you. David sacrificed greatly for those in need. And thirdly, David brought someone in need into his inner circle. 
Now keep in mind, I mean, this is a king's table. This is where his family would eat. And he brought somebody in need into the at inner circle. You know we have inner circles, don't we? For instance, a great example is we have, we have here at Grace Church of Nazarene, we're a circle, right? And we have this inner, we love each other. Most of us love each other. Some of us love each other. No, we all love each other, right? We have this inner circle. And it would be easy for us to say, listen, this is our circle. We don't want anybody else in here. This makes us feel like a family. And isn't it something how in the last few months we have had some extreme growing pains? I mean, extreme growing pains. I say this often, man, uh, church would be easy if we never grew. But we want people to come on into this inner circle. People who are needy, people who need help, people who are like us, desperate for Jesus Christ. But not only are churches inner circle, you know, your family is an inner circle. Your family, it's fun to get together with family, isn't it? I can remember as a kid growing up, again, my mom had like 15 of us kids. Um, but every Christmas, we'd have like three or four foster children in our home. And I can remember as a kid, when I was young and immature a few years ago, I can remember almost being a little bit jealous. Like, you know what? This, this child has taken my Christmas presents. But I'm so grateful that I had a mom and dad that said, you know what? We're going to bring kids into our inner circle. Kids who have needs. Kids who don't have what we have. Kids that just need to be loved. Kids that just need to be hugged on. Kids that just need Christmas presents. I had a mom and dad that, that brought them into our inner circle. There would even be like Thanksgivings where a family would be eating Thanksgiving with us. And I can remember as a teenager just being like, huh, this is my family. But I had a mom and dad that demonstrated that, you know what, there's needy people that we need to bring into our inner circle. Teenagers, you have inner circles. You have friends that you like to hang around with, and I'm not putting that down. But you know what, there's kids in your hallway that walk up and down the hallway every day that just need a friend, that just need somebody to love on them, just need to be accepted. Wouldn't it be something if the mark of our teenagers, and I think it is, is that, you know what, we allow anybody into our circle. If we see somebody that's lonely and hurting, we're going to let them in. The story ends with this. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. And just in case we forgot, the author wanted us to know he was lame in both feet. My challenge for us as a church, we got people all around us that are in need. People that are lonely, people that are hurting, people that don't have as much as we do. Are we looking for them? Are our eyes open? Are we on purpose not saying, hey, notice me, notice me, look at me? Are we on purpose out looking for them? And then if we are, what sacrifices are we willing to make for them? And who this week can we bring into our inner circle? I have at the end of your notes there a place where you can talk about it. I encourage you to go home today and grab your family and talk about this. Go through these questions. I'm convinced of this. God bless David for living this kind of life. I believe God will bless us if we do the same. I'd like a worship team to come on up. Just for a few seconds, just nobody looking around, everybody bow their heads, close their eyes. Nobody looking around. How many of you would you say, even as I'm sharing this with you today, would, would you be willing to say, just by lifting quickly up your hand, would you say, you know what, a name and face came to my mind even as you were talking about this, just real quick. Yeah, all over this place. All over this place. Why don't this week, why don't we do something about it? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Why don't we just say we're not going to be consumed with self this week, which is easy to get caught up in. Why don't we say this week we're going to get caught up in these other people? If, as we talked about this, no name or face came to you today, the, 
the worship band is just going to play a song and we can sing to it if we want. Some of you can just sit there and pray. But maybe we ought to ask God the Holy Spirit to put somebody in our mind that this week we can go after. Somebody who might be going through a difficult time, somebody who might have a serious need. And why don't this week let's go out and let's meet that need. Maybe even bring them into our inner circle.